Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is Marina Zerko, and I am co-moderating this panel with my collaborator, Nancy Novacek, who is uh, somewhere on the screen to my left. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you again for joining us. Um, we'd like to offer a very warm thanks to the Institute for hosting this event, to Nahed and Sharon and Ralph, and also a very big thank you to Lee Watts in Academic Affairs and to Maya Allison, the curator of the NYU AD Art Gallery. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, um, for those of you not in Abu Dhabi or in the know, uh, we just wanna offer a little bit of background information on how this panel came to be. This began as a research project in 2018 when I was affiliate faculty on the NYU AD campus in the interactive media department. Nancy joined me as a visiting scholar that spring and while we didn't know where this project was going to go, we followed a lead at the suggestion of biologist John Burt to look at a tiny artificial island just off the coast of downtown Abu Dhabi. For a little perspective, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, is situated on the Arabian Peninsula, which forms the Arabian Gulf, a region comprising islands and dunes, oil and fisheries, mountains and oases. Abu Dhabi, the capital of the Seven Emirates, is a natural archipelago of over 200 islands of varying sizes and states. Some are home to rare species of flora, some are densely developed. Many are human-made islands, including our habitat compensation island. Habitat compensation island is a geographic fact on navigational charts, but it can't be found with a Google search. It's a 15-minute boat ride from Emirates Palace Marina, sited between an offshore oil field and the edge of the shipping channel that serves Abu Dhabi's industrial port. It was created 10 years ago from the new channel's marine dredge. Abu Dhabi's Department of Urban Planning conceived of the island as ecological compensation for damage that may have been caused by the channel dredging. Made from the bottom of the sea, this island was designed in a C-shape, creating a shallow interior lagoon intended as habitat for local marine flora and fauna. To encourage a new community of non-humans, it was seeded with 350,000 mangroves. The Department of Urban, Urban Planning also designed a vision plan to transform Habitat Compensation Island into an ecological preserve and an education-focused destination. An ambitious experimental project of marine engineering and environmental problem solving, Habitat Compensation Island itself is a monument to ecological optimism. At the moment, the island remains an enigma on the landscape and seascape, with its bleached blank billboards and accumulating marine plastic debris. Habitat Compensation Island inspired us to ask several questions. How can artificial islands serve as monuments to entangled nature culture assemblages and offer ecological reparations amidst the tug of human-centered interests? Today's panel discussion began with our inquiry into this artificial island and into the goals of environmentally, environmentally focused artificial islands in general. And this in turn became a small book published in both Arabic and English with written contributions by Abdullah Al Sadi. Munira Al Sayeg, Niels Bubont, Yuna Chowdhury, whom you'll hear from today, Aline Gann, Aisha Hadir, and Graham McKay. The book uses Habitat Compensation Island as a focusing device through which we might approach the convergence of nature, culture, and commerce, all amplified in the shadow of rapid climate changes. In our hearts, we thought of the island as a monument to possibility with its incidental audience of cargo ship workers passing through Musafa Channel on their way in and out of the port of Abu Dhabi. Monuments are also focusing devices. And while we are by no means monument experts, 
we'd say that monuments are built with present and future people in mind. They venerate, celebrate, elevate, memorialize. They are sites of grief and triumph. Monuments of American power are especially contentious at the moment and the subject of a much needed debate. There are also instances of things that are not explicitly expressions of power, such as what we see in this set of images. And nonetheless, we are directed to consider these also as a form of pride or the notion of an earthly jewel, something to be preserved and protected for its significance, even though not inhabited by humans, but rather by other flora and fauna. These monuments are considered to be of outstanding value to humanity, and yet, are these indicators of a multi-species ethos? The book that we made was envisioned as a catalyst to a much larger conversation, and today we're here at the start of that. And we are delighted to have been generously met by our panelists to look into the possibility of this preposterous question, can we conceive of a monument to all species? And with that, we would like to introduce our three panelists who will be presenting in the order of their bios. Yuna Chowdhury is Collegiate Professor and Professor of English, Drama, and Environmental Studies at New York University. She is currently the Director of NYU's Graduate Program, XE, Experimental Human Humanities and Social Engagement. Her current work explores what she calls ecospheric consciousness, ideas, feelings, and practices that attend to the multi-species and the geophysical contexts of human lives. A pioneer in the field of eco-theater, plays and performances that engage with the subjects of ecology and environment, as well as the related field of eco-criticism, which studies art and literature from an ecological perspective, Chowdhury participates in collaborative art and research projects, including the think tank Climate Lens and the ongoing multi-platform Dear Climate. Samantha Muka is Assistant Professor of Science Technology Studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology. She is a historian and sociology, so sociologist of marine science. Her book, Inland Oceans, explores how the development of aquarium craft influences human interactions with the sea. Her current project explores human interactions with the ocean through tracing the history of artificial coral reefs and beach building. Bronislaw Szczynski is professor of sociology at Lancaster University. He is author of multiple books, including Nature, Technology and the Sacred, Nature Performed, and Techno Futures. His research seeks to situate social life in the longer perspective of human and planetary history, drawing on the social and natural sciences, arts and humanities. His outputs also include performances, art science exhibitions, and experimental participatory workshops. He was co-organizer of the public art science events between nature, explorations in ecology and performance, experimentality, and the Anthropocene moment with Bruno Latour and Oliver Michelin. Welcome. We will begin with Yuna. Mm -hmm. What time are you? Um, well, um, First of all, let me start by thanking you all so much for uh, including me in this. Rena and Nancy just said that they weren't experts on monuments. I'm much less of an expert than they are. But I was very grateful to be included in, um, well, today, and also in the book project that uh, uh, we just heard about. Um, we were asked to write about islands for that. And I chose to write about something called a refuge island, uh, which is actually a human-made um, uh, phenomenon. It's a kind of traffic island. And just thinking back on that, I, um, it occurred to me that the one reason I chose that is because um, probably in all the work I try to do these days, uh, one of the impulses is to constantly disrupt or contest the, um, the binary, the very hardened binary between nature and culture, um, and to find whatever opportunities to uh, you know, disrupt that and the hierarchies that go with it. And one of the uh, abiding versions of that binary is that between uh, the city 
and the countryside or the urban versus the rural. Um, and so I chose to write about the um, uh, a city phenomenon, an island within a city. Um, and I think that uh, I would say that the uh, impulse to contest that binary is maybe one of the most important developments and characteristic developments of contemporary um, ecological thought in the 21st century, uh, which is the recognition of the ideological force behind um, the inscription of that boundary and uh, its role in creating and normalizing um, a really disastrous alienation uh, between us humans, our species, and all the other species, animals, landscapes, plants, um, with whom we share the planet. Um, so thinking about today's topic, that's certainly something I'm very, that I'd want to foreground, is the contesting of uh, oppositions, um, you know, all versions of nature culture oppositions, including, I think, in this case, um, that between wilderness and civilization, because, of course, in thinking about monuments to species, we immediately start um, thinking about wild animals. Um, and at the same time, we're bringing one of the languages or rhetorics, uh, privileged rhetorics of civilization, which is monumentality and, and monument building, uh, to that subject. So I'd, I'd want to uh, disrupt that. Um, also, another binary is that between various kinds of animals, uh, so charismatic megafauna uh, versus ordinary animals and domestic animals. And, and in that regard, I uh, just want to share a couple of items uh, from recent news that delighted people in, in my community. Uh, one was, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, one was, and this was all over Facebook, um, when Magawa, the landmine detecting rat, was awarded a medal for um, uh, their work in locating and clearing deadly mines in Cambodia. Now, this isn't a monument yet, but the image there uh, cries out to be monumentalized. And I simply hope that if, if that does happen, um, whoever does it will resist the temptation to make Magawa any more than uh, his, his wonderful little life size. It'd be wonderful to have a tiny little monument somewhere. Um, another item was, um, uh, let's see, yeah, when uh, recently when the uh, Confederate monuments were being uh, dis dismantled, removed, uh, we started a small movement asking that they remove the generals but leave the horses. Uh, didn't get very far, but it would be lovely to have uh, monuments with just um, those uh, important figures in history, those animals. Um, so another principle, uh, another dichotomy that I want to try to displace um, is the one between um, extinct and endangered animals versus all the animals we're living with today. And it's not surprising that uh, in terms of multi-species monuments, it has been uh, those animals um, uh, that have become extinct that have been most, uh, uh, that have you know, drawn the attention. And in particular, uh, the, the attention of artists. And in particular, it's uh, this, the, um, the figure of the endling or terminarch, which is the name for the last surviving member of a species before it becomes extinct. Um, and one of the most monumentalized of um, uh, endlings was Martha, the last uh, passenger pigeon, um, who went extinct in 1914. Uh, in fact, what we have here, the image here, is of the first um, monument to an extinct species ever done. And this was in Wisconsin in 1947. 
And interestingly, at the dedication, um, one of the speakers was Aldo Leopold, uh, who is, of course, a, a major figure in ecological thought and um, the author of the idea of uh, thinking like a mountain. Um, and I think that uh, the ideas conveyed in that uh, classic essay um, are at the heart of some of the thinking that I'd want to see happen around multi-species monuments, thinking like a mountain. Um, the um, uh, Martha has been uh, memorialized a lot. There are many uh, monuments to passenger pigeons all around the country. Um, probably the most famous is this one, which is at the Cincinnati Zoo, where Martha uh, lived and died. And uh, that in the back, uh, that strange archi uh, uh, architecture of a pagoda, was the pavilion in which she lived. Um, and uh, in these mem memorializations, of course, the question comes up as to what is the affect uh, being um, uh, constellated and encouraged and offered. Um, when Aldo Leopold spoke, he said that it was grief. And he noted that this was a new kind of grief that we were experiencing. Uh, although we were aware of um, human-made species extinction since the time of the dodo, it was with the passenger pigeon that that consciousness began to really dawn. And, and I think this is a big question as to uh, what is the, um, or the, what are the affects that we uh, um, want to um, uh, imagine and evoke and contest uh, in, our, uh, in our thinking in this way. Um, of course, these kinds of monuments are also pretty uh, controversial because they uh, exemplify a logic of monumentality, which is a logic of exceptionalism and individualism. And many of these are uh, tendencies that uh, are, um, you know, that uh, we're somewhat suspicious of in, um, uh, within ecological thought. Uh, another one recently, similar impulse, is the Lost Bird Project, which takes five um, important extinct species and has made sculptures, and these are displayed all around. Um, another, probably the, one of the most famous, is the planned uh, monument, uh, it's called the Mass Extinction Mon Monitoring Observatory um, by the British architect David Ajaya uh, on an island in England. And this is conceived, I don't know if you can see the, the graphic on the right-hand side of my screen, but um, this is going to involve uh, a great many artists, all, uh, each of whom will be invited to uh, carve effigies of all the species that have gone extinct, and it's conceived as an ongoing uh, project to, uh, which will continue to add species as they go extinct. Okay, I see that I've already used up my, uh, my 10 minutes. Um, I was going to talk about uh, Maya Lin, and I will be coming back, I think, in our conversations to um, this kind of monument, the one I'm most interested in, uh, currently, which are temporary monuments, which I think contest the, those logics that I find problematic. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yuna. It was a great opening and a great challenge to think about uh, getting beyond the binaries. Um, Sam? Okay. Um, hello, <laughs> and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to go a different direction today um, and talk a little bit about the history of building for multiple species. And so the way that I approached this was, um, as a historian, 
Um, and someone who studies, um, previously my work is on aquarium craft. So the way that um, humans have learned to uh, build small scale environmental models. And so um, in my book, I look at the way that uh, aquarium work kind of moving an environment inland has allowed us to know the ocean in a very specific way. Um, but as I look at kind of the island building uh, and reef building in the open ocean, there's a lot uh, to be said about studying actually how people learn to do these things um, and how that has shifted over time. So the actual kind of materiality of building for multiple species and what that means. Um, and so there are two projects that I have been working on and one is beach building. Um, and there's a lot of different names for it, beach building, coastal reconstruction, um, and beef or, or beach renourishment. And I put re kind of in there because um, there's this idea of reconstruction or nourishment. And a lot of times the way that we talk about these things is reflective of the way that we sell them to the public and the way that we utilize them as humans. And so if you talk about re-nourishing something, um, you're kind of making a lot of statements about what should be there and what isn't there and why something isn't there, right? And so, um, you know, uh, there's the sense of temporality in which you've missed the time period in which it should be there, but we're going to put it back again. Um, the project I'm going to talk about more today um, is my work on reef building and restoration. And again, I think the words really matter when we use them. So monument is a word that we can talk about what we mean by that. Um, but when we talk about building a coral reef, um, that might have a different meaning to us than re restoration or reconstruction. Um, and it might change the shape or how we're doing it. So um, there are two different types of reef building, and the first uh, type is called passive restoration or building, and this image is of the Florida Keys. Um, this is called Shipwreck Trail, and this is oftentimes what people think of when they think of building a reef um, is, or at least an artificial reef. Uh, we have ships that have been sank off the coast. Many of them are decommissioned uh, military vessels. Um, and they started, you know, doing this type of sinking pretty early on in the 50s and 60s to attract game fish for fishermen and to attract tourism once uh, snorkeling and scuba diving um, took off. Um, and the most recent one was sunk in, I think, 2018. But this is a reef tract that has struggled quite a bit. And we're gonna see there are multiple ways that people are trying to build in this particular location to maintain what we imagine should be there. Uh, obviously, Florida is not the only place that we're doing this and I'm quite close to this. Uh, I'm in this area <laughs> right now, but um, New York has just announced in 19, or 2019 and 2020 the expansion of artificial reefs. All of these will be built in these areas with recycled materials, uh, railway cars, uh, barges, and all of the recycled material from the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is being torn down. And so um, this is happening really um, as we speak. And, it, you know, it's interesting to hear uh, Nancy mention the kind of conversation between nature, culture, and commerce, because this these types of projects, um, passive reef restoration, is exactly that. There's a lot of commerce involved in the idea of um, the culture of um, viewing the ocean as we imagine it to be, right, or that it should be, and it should be filled with a lot of fish. But what's interesting is that um, in our thinking about nature and culture and what belongs at the bottom of the ocean, apparently um, a, a decommissioned New York subway train falls into that category, <laughs> as long as there are fish swimming in and out of it. This is nothing that's really new. And so previously, these types of projects were very 
um, commerce centered. And it was, it was a, an idea of how many people can you please in this project? And so um, in 1972, you may have heard of the Osborne Reef. It was about 2 million tires dumped off the coast of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, the metal pinnings that were supposed to keep this reef together eroded almost immediately. And over the next 50 years, they've spent time trying to pick out as many uh, tires as they can. And uh, this Osborne Reef has been responsible for some of the worst damage to the reef that still exists in the Florida Reef Tract. And so um, they were previously kind of supposed to kill two birds with one stone. Um, they didn't want to put any more tires in landfills. And so Goodyear said, that they would give an enormous amount of money to rent these barges if all of these tires would just be thrown into the ocean to make a coral reef. Um, I can't describe to you what a bad idea that was. <laughs> I think that you can uh, see that for yourself. And then you can see the same type of, um, you know, let's do everything at once with Sea Warp, which was a co coal waste artificial reef program off Long Island Sound in 1978. These are blocks built of coal waste that were thrown into the ocean in the hopes that they would attract coral polyps to settle on them. Um, the program was um, stopped in 1983, and there's only actually been two papers on this particular program, so it's unclear why they stopped that program, um, but I'm assuming it's because it wasn't a very good substrate for polyp settling. Over time, a lot of different groups have become involved in these type of monuments that are multi-species. And so this is actually also in the Florida Keys. This is at John Pennycamp uh, State Park. It's one of the only underwater parks in the United States. And on the left-hand side, this is an art installation uh, that uses something called electro deposition, which is a um, form of um, electro, like putting electricity through metal that attracts um, calcium deposits, which hopefully speeds up the polyp transfer and settlement onto these pieces. These are the kind of passive ways that we have done this. Um, and artists have all tried to come up with um, new ways to get coral settlement. And so this is um, on the right in 2020, actually January 2020 in Thailand. This is a 3D printed concrete uh, reef structure. And on the left is the more common and more popular things. They're called reef balls. But recently there's been an uptake in um, what we call active restoration. And this is actively farming or genetically manipulating coral in order to help build um, a longer lasting reef system. And so um, this particular picture, which I find um, slightly disconcerting in the middle is a picture of the Coral Reef Foundation. Uh, these are nurseries of um, staghorn coral. And on the right, you can see these are new fragments, what they call frags of that coral. So these um, wires will be suspended from a tree until they mature, and then they'll be outplanted into a new reef system to be farmed. In addition to that kind of farming, you get, this is a picture of uh, Ruth Gates and her laboratory in Hawaii before she passed away a few years ago. Um, Gates and Madeline von Oppen, who are, who's in Australia, are finding what they see as hardy species of coral that are surviving um, bleaching events. They bring them into the laboratory and then they genetically analyze them to see if they can um, speed up the evolution of coral to match the um, timeline of climate uh, change that we're seeing in the ocean, which is much faster than on land. And so um, they are, it's what they call assisted evolution. And then there are people such as Jamie Craggs, who's at the um, Horniman Museum in the UK, um, and also just takes really stunning photos. <laughs> he is an aquarist who's working on sexually reproducing corals. So you help the genetic 
um, diversity of coral and make it more likely that they'll survive if you can um, sexually reproduce them in the laboratory and in tanks. This is an incredibly hard thing to do to reproduce um, the environment for sexual reproduction in the laboratory. But Craig's has been pretty good at this, and also he is working with the Coral uh, Restoration Foundation in Florida so that once they learn how to reproduce in captivity, they'll grow them, and then they will transplant them into the ocean. And so you get this working together of a large network of people. They're all kind of doing their part. Some are working directly in the ocean. Some are working in the laboratory. But... What has become really clear recently is that we actually don't know um, that much about what we can do to build in the marine environment. And even though people have been throwing stuff into the ocean and hoping that it attracts fish and coral um, for a very long time, or for what seems like a very long time, um, it's only recently within the last decade that we've seen any conversation about um, comparing these methods and what really works. And in fact, um, you can still see that people who are building monuments or doing large art exhibits in the ocean as monuments um, are not really paying as much attention to what will function as a multi-species monument. And in that sense, um, we know that um, outplanting on um, certain substrates is much better than uh, reef balls, but there is a sense in which reef balls or 3D printed concrete is both cheaper, but also more um, pleasing to the eye and faster growing. So people are more likely to associate it with a healthier reef and a healthier system and having done something or said something out loud in a very particular way. Um, so as I've been kind of thinking about this project and thinking about island building, um, one of my larger questions has been kind of what can we see in history when it comes to what's possible? Obviously, what I see is a shift over time from a focus on only human use or human thought to a uh, focus on multi-species and environmental rehabilitation and regeneration. And so there is a, a idea now of constructing things that are both beautiful and useful and knowledgeable. Um, and there's also been a shift from a focus on commercial and kind of vacation boosterism to joint efforts between large networks. It's really important though to note that it doesn't mean that there's a dropping out of human use um, every project is a project in many instances that is geared towards saving humans, <laughs> saving the environment we have learned to value, and kind of um, constructing a marine environment that makes sense to us as we imagine that it should be, right? Um, and I think that's where I'm questioning kind of what we can learn from this history that I said. Um, and a lot of it has to do with time. And so I'm really excited um, that Una has mentioned kind of the conversations about um, temporary things, because, you know, one of the things if, if we are to build multi-species monuments um, with other species or for other species, what I think is very interesting is to pay attention to the past, what is supposed to be there or what has been there, and also what people have done in the past that has failed. Um, surprising there, there's not a lot of literature on failed reefs, um, and there's not a lot of understanding of what it would mean to have a successful reef as a monument. And so actually I'm part of a working group for the um, coral reef restoration uh, community. And actually tomorrow we're having a white paper working group on how you would identify and, and work out what is a successful reef restoration project, right? When does it begin? When does it end? What does it mean to put back one species versus another to build for a species, et cetera? The other thing about time is, is paying attention to how long something does take to build. Um, and how long it takes to even build a network for multi-species kind of um, building. And then the one that's most interesting to me and that I would love to talk about, especially when it comes to island building or reef building, 
is how long you want something to last, how long it should be there. Um, and in some sense, there's a question of what is the life cycle of a multi-species monument, which beach building and island building has a lot of erosion questions. Um, and so when you start to approach these projects, what does it mean for something to erode over time? Is that part of the monument? Is it built into the life cycle of this um, piece? And then with reef building, um, there's often questions about um, our imagination of, of, an, of a reef as static. It's supposed to look like this. Um, but where do we kind of come into conversations about uh, allowing death and kind of uh, conversations in that way. So, okay, that's what I have. Sam, thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about and talk about. Um, we are excited for Braun to bring up our last set of ideas. Bronislav, uh, turn your camera on, if you will, please. Yeah, sorry about that. My controls disappeared. Uh, let, you'll let me know, I'm sure, if you if you can't see my slides. It looks okay. Good. Yeah. Is it all good? Terrific. Great. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, thanks again to Marina and Nancy for organising this and getting us all here. It's been really uh, exciting already. So, um, yeah. Um, so, I'm going to start off by no noting that I was really interested to see a nice sort of summary of a paper by me in the book that uh, Marina mentioned that came, came out of this project. Um, so, in this quote from their book on Habitat Compensation Island. Uh, they kind of summarize a part of a paper that I wrote on the Anthropocene monument. So that's kind of what I am going to, that's what I'm going to focus on now is talking about um, the, uh, the ideas I've been having over the last um, six or so years about what a, a monument in the context of the Anthropocene might look like. Uh, and it's great that we've had the other two talks first, and I'm trying to refer back to them as much as I can, because there's been some great ideas already. So one of the things that uh, that quote, that sort of paraphrase of my paper is talking about, these different kinds of value. Um, now, I should say, first of all, that my thinking about the Anthropocene Monument was really developed through uh, this collaboration that I had with Bruno Latour, the philosopher, and also Olivier Michelon, the um, curator at uh, Toulouse at the uh, Les Abattoirs, which is a, a museum of modern art in Toulouse in southern France. And so we put out a call to artists um, in early 2014 to design a, a monument to the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene, if you don't know, is this proposed name for a new geological epoch of the earth. Um, uh, in which human beings are the prime geological agent which is shifting the earth into a new system state so hence the anthropo bit of the name there is referring to the humans so it's sometimes translated as the age of humans um so yeah so um so yeah that quote um from my paper or the paraphrase from my paper was partly referring to this work um uh, by uh alphonse uh, sorry alois reigel um the Modern Cult of Monuments, which is a sort of classic uh, paper or report, if you like, from 1903, which is trying to define um, how modern, a sort of modernist manifesto for defining how you interpret and value monuments in their changing place in modern culture. So in the paper, he, get, he describes these different kinds of values. Um, and I want to focus on those memory values, first of all. So these are ways in which, for example, um, monuments and edifices of different kinds break, keep a moment alive and make them present in the consciousness of uh, of future generations um so in in this in his paper he also talks about how the value the, which values are kind of foremost in the way a particular epoch of course he's talking about european history here um the way 
monuments are valued and the different way they kind of mesh with memory uh, changes over time. So in the Renaissance, the sort of idea of um, sort of emergent ideas of um, antiquarianism and the emergence of uh, um, archaeolog archaeological ideas of the past, you know, artifacts in, in the um, ground and so on, or looking at ruins was about the historical value, what it tells us about past ages, whereas in the Romantic era there's much more sort of pleasurable somatic pleasure in seeing decay and getting a sense of great age and this will become really relevant when we talk about geological monuments uh, and then the commemorative value is the one that we find hardest to deal with nowadays and that's the one that's really been contested in the um in the, in the usa recently and also in britain as well to do with the slave trade and so on just commemorative uh monuments of uh, empires and nation nation building and so on but also many modernist buildings have a kind of um uh monumentality you know um which is important too and then there's this postmodern return to symbolism that breaks up the idea of a singular national history into sort of multiple counter narratives and i'll return to that as well so there's, there's monuments in a way, the way monuments are valued at different times tell you a lot about the culture at that, that kind of time. So but instead of talking about memory, so, you know, Rigel talks about memory, and instead, um, that quote, quote uh, that paraphrase of my work in um, Marina and uh, Nancy's book, also talks about the meshing of times together, and this is where it works well with the idea of the Anthropocene as a sort of clashing of human time geological time so Dipesh Chakravarti the historian has written some very seminal papers about how you know historical time can no longer be kept separate separate from the time of the earth as described by geologists um, and so this term allochrony here I'm using it in a way to describe any kind of cultural process if you like and process of meaning making where what is seen as separate times come together so this relates in a way to what Una was saying about, um, you know, so Una was saying she wants to contest the distinction between nature and culture. And what's interesting is that monuments, as it were, police the distinction between, if you like, human time and what I call as a general category, inhuman time. So it might be the time of, uh, you know, of, the, of mythological uh, gods or creator beings or culture heroes and human time. Um, and now it's the earth is this sort of separate time that's sort of somehow not, can't be reduced to human historical time, you know, since we discovered geological deep time in the 19th century. But in a funny way, monuments, they both um, police that gap, uh, but they also connect things together. And it's rather like a a wall or a boundary, you know, divides things, but it also joins things together. So this policing is all is about separating, but also controlling the passage between them. So it's not wholly about this sort of stark dualism. Uh, another way to describe this, these, these two kind of times. Um, so Ayan and Aleda Asman talk about the distinction between communicative time, so the time of, as it were, human memory and communication. You know, what we call living memory, which is often conceived as a as a rough kind of slice of generations of about four generations. If you think of you know us, you know babies and their great grandparents, things being passed from generation to another, and this this slice of humanity slowly kind of moves through time as as one generation drops out slowly, another generation is born. So this um, but then outside that communicative memory is well, something that's more transpersonal or in some sense inhuman, uh, this cultural memory, you know, and as I say, it takes different forms. Sometimes it's sort of supernatural time is outside the human time. And sometimes nowadays it's a more like a sort of scientific time of, of you know, the universe or, or the uh, deep time of the earth and so on. But over time, over you know, in different uh, societies, there are different cultural mechanisms to both constitute and also join and reach over that gap, either ritual, the sort of taking on, you know, if it's shamanic, taking on of other kinds, of shifting one's identity, or just recounting, you know, in the Christian Eucharist, you know, the time of creation and incarnation and all that. 
but also in um, in the literary cultures of um, what are known often as the axial um, cultures across Europe and Asia. Uh, the the rise of writing as a generalized tool, not just the province of um, of special a specialized caste, means that as it were, canonical writings um, by, you know, the Buddha or by uh, Moses or, or by, you know, the Greek philosophers become these timeless texts, you know, that, that sort of reach across, if you like, our own human time and the sort of some time that is transpersonal. But anyway, of course, monuments is what I'm leading up to. Monuments um, also are a way of as it were, managing that relation between different forms of time. And interestingly, I was thinking about Una's medals for the land mine clearing rats, and medals are in a way, a way of elevating an individual human, an individual human act to this sort of heroic time, you know. And if you think of the sort of, um, like I thought a lot about um, the Parthenon frieze at the Acropolis in Athens, you know, which is this amazing piece of, art where uh, gods and humans are all present in the same uh, image and um, some of the the humans that are represented on the Parthenon frieze are as it were soldiers uh, who had fought in a particular battle and had therefore been elevated to these sort of timeless heroes and so now rats are being elevated as well which is great so so one, one way that I think might be useful to think about uh, Habitat Compensation Island as a monument is to think more broadly about a monumental system. So for me, a monumental system is, some, is, is a kind of material semiotic assemblage which establishes relations between physical structures, whether they're enduring things like the, uh, the Parthenon or um, artificial islands made of sand, also spaces, spaces around those structures and also the human bodies and as it were the spatio-temporal patterns of social life so that the image the kind of reconstructed image of the acropolis bottom left shows the um annual ceremony of the uh it's called the athenaeum or something it's for the patron goddess of athens athena and a particular parade that went all the way through the city and then up into this monumental complex at the top of the hill, the Acropolis. Um, but then if you look top right, um, this is, uh, just quickly I found this morning, this is the map of the progress where the state opening of parliament in Great Britain and there's this sort of processional um, proce procession <laughs> uh, from uh, Buckingham Palace, the site of the monarchy, to the Houses of Parliament and passing various over ceremonial, uh, monumental um, edifices, if you like. But actually, I also wanted to say that monuments aren't necessarily, maybe, sort of slightly disagreeing with Una, although her presentation was absolutely amazing, um, that monuments aren't necessarily coded to exceptionalism. You know, okay, this procession may or may not pass Nelson's column with, um, uh, you know, Nelson at the top of this very tall column, which, you know, performs exceptionalism to a ridiculous, absurd degree. But actually, the bottom right image is the image of the... Um, part of the uh, Vienna Ringstrasse, which is a kind of um, a, an array of all the kind of key monumental buildings using very monumental architecture of liberal Austria, um, conceived as a kind of bulwark against the countervailing uh, tendencies of, towards autocracy and absolute monarchy within uh, Vienna. So as you move around these buildings, you know, the Natural History Museum, the Opera and things like that, uh, the parliament, you are moving within a monumental system that actually performs in maybe forms of exclusion as well, but ones which are at least liberal forms of exclusion based on the idea of, of, of equal citizenship. Anyway, just a thought. So I need to keep moving. So, um, so geological monuments also have their monumental systems. So I can't, I'm going to have to just really explain this very roughly, but basically, so a monumental system here is a way of stabilizing deep time by reference to human time 
in the present. So, um, so the example I'm using on the right here is um, a particular monumental system, which is the bottom of the uh, Devonian period, um, which is, so each geological age um, is a global age, you know, so the Devonian was a period of time um, which was really important in various ways uh, to do with the evolution of um, animals and so on. Um, but it, it was, it's a global phenomenon. It was a global phenomenon, uh, but it is, has to be found and, as it were, stabilized in reference to a particular place on the Earth's surface. And it just happens to be in, in the Czech Republic, at this place called Klonk, K-L-O-N-K, which is a really nice name. And so there's this kind of monumental system, which is marking out the particular strata on this cliff face behind the, the, the bottom at the back of the bottom image, uh, where you can see the bottom, you know, sort of uh, the, bo the bottom as in the earliest point of the Devonian. Uh, and nearby is a monument, a rather sort of classic monument, as you can see in the foreground, on which there is this plaque, um, which explains what's going on here. And so there's complicated semiotics, which is holding together uh, deep time of the earth, which is it, it mapped onto the vertical face of the cliff behind you. Also the globe, because this is the local place that, you, that stabilizes this global idea of deep time. Uh, but also it has to mesh with the human time. And that's particularly the power of the International Geological Congress of 1972 to, to pronounce this as, you know, a, the, the right place to do this and so on. So I'm going to skip over that slide. Um, so I just want to say something about the monument um, exhibition. And we had lots, I'm going to have to go really fast here. We had lots of different, uh, we had about 20, 25, I think it was, different um, exhibits. So and I'm just going to just say, okay, I'll just do it. So some of the artists came up with intentional monuments, uh, to use Rigel's category. Um, where they came up with a designed monument uh, which could be built in some way uh, and they were really interesting in their own way. Others, and this is a little bit more like uh, what we're talking about today, took existing edifices and repurposed them f uh, as monuments to the Anthropocene, everything from the Berlin Olympic Stadium built by the Nazis to a um, uh, an, uh, the runway on uh, Nauru Island, uh, sealed with crushed prehistoric coral and things like that. Uh, and in a way that was very consistent with the idea where the Anthropocene blurs, you know, nature and culture in interesting ways. Um, some came up with ideas of future fossils that might be found, of human artifacts being dug up in the future. Others created arch the, their monument took the form of an archive recording how we are changing the environment. The last, and the last category, um, the, which is something a little bit similar to the sort of thing that Una didn't have time to talk about, which were events, much more time-based monuments, like um, uh, uh, mist and fog created by F Fujiko Nakaya, uh, or a, uh, a protest against um, the, 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 um, uh, the, the violent suppression of a protest of miners in South Africa. Um, so I just want to end with this slide, which really captures the way that the artists, um, as it were, messed with the, what a conventional idea of the monument in a way which is quite consistent with some of the discussion I had earlier. And so the first thing they did, that the artists generally um, participated in this wider late 20th century reaction against traditional monumental codes, including those that are still being used in the geological sciences. So rather than suggesting versions of what Pierre Nora calls canonical sites of memory, you know, where you go to a particular place to remember something, the artists uh, instead seem to realise that what was needed was something that Michael Rothberg calls no, multi-sited nodes of memory, which are heterogeneous sort of networks of remembering uh, that take place at different times and places. Uh, secondly, consistent with that sort of post-human, post-natural aspect of the Anthropocene that Una was talking about, sort of blurring nature and culture, 
um, these monuments didn't perform a clear metaphysical gulf between the deep time of the earth and human history of action. And there's a, there's a particular reason for this, I think, which is the, the fact that the Anthropocene is not, like, can't be easily consigned to, as it were, the timeless time of the gods or the culture hero founders of human society, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, or, or whatever. Um, it's happening now, and it's dependent on choices we are making in the present. Um, so it's... So the counter monuments being po proposed by all these artists, which are variously mobile, dispersed, transient, or particularly demanded interaction and, and action, they serve not to consolidate cultural memory, as it were, against the time that's passed, to, but to provoke uh, communicative memory, uh, debate and action. And I can see that that's the sort of thing that Marina and Nancy are hoping will happen with um, Habitat Compensation Island as well. Thank you, I'll finish there. Thank you all. That was phenomenal. Um, Nancy, should I go ahead and just sort of set the stage? Okay. So what we thought, it's uh, 1025 and that we would spend um, 10 or 15 minutes letting the panelists either make a remark or response or ask a question of each other, uh, if that's okay. and. Um, I'm sure you have lots to say. There's so much overlap and also so much so much distinction. And Sam, I so appreciated something that you brought up that made me think of how scientists in labs are spending all this time, um, like artists in studios. The the time the temporality is very switched up in terms of uh, you have to do all this work in the lab, not in the installation necessarily. So the installation is a different kind of temporality in, in the kind of work you're talking about. That's my one comment. Um, I, I really want to bring this practice that Sam, all the practices Sam is addressing into the conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll let you all uh, have have some time. Uh, I don't know who would like to start. And then um, I see there's some questions uh, aggregating in the Q&A that um, we'll get to in by 1045, okay? You know. Um, wow, that, that's all, those were just such fabulous presentations, uh, Branislav and Sam. I, uh, uh, I'm amazed at how much you packed in. I wanted to try to connect. Um, uh, I, I had many questions coming up, and as Branislav kept talking, he kept on answering many of my questions, but many of them had to do with performance. Uh, and you got to that when you started talking about ritual and so on. Um, but I wanted to connect two ideas. One, when Sam was talking about useful monuments um, and also monuments as habitats. And in, in fact, you seem to be using the word multi-species monuments really to mean monuments built for other species, which is different from how, uh, how I've been uh, thinking about them. Um, Hmm. Did this just did this just come up uh, somehow? Okay, um, and then with uh, so that's one uh, thing I want to put in conversation with. The other is um, uh, Bronislaw's point about uh, monuments occupying this liminal space between human time and in and various kinds of inhuman times, um, but also. Um, opening a space for a conversation or, or some kind of uh, movement between those, those two kinds of time. And um, in the way I've been thinking about uh, uh, multi-species monuments, uh, one of the things is the question of what um, the non-human, the more than human, does to time itself. Um, and therefore, to all these schemas by which we've tried to organize our understanding of commemoration, history, memory, and so forth. So in that Aldo Leopold piece I mentioned, which he dedicated the monument to Martha, he says, um, 
right now, while we've just while this is put up, there are still people, there are still human beings who remember the passenger pigeon. But there will come a time when the only ones who will remember will be the trees. And then eventually, even those thousand year oaks will have died and all that will be remembering are, I mean, all that's left will be the hills themselves. Um, so there's a, a sense that in entering into that space of trying to uh, memorialize or uh, commemorate the more than human, whether it's species or landscapes, you you uh, have an opportunity to confront some very different account of uh, life on this planet, and perhaps of humans living in a different way as well. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that the example you gave, Branislav, of uh, the kinds of rituals, civic rituals, people marching around in Vienna, um, are capacious enough to to provide that um, the, the, you know this paradigm shifting uh, encounter with uh, a new human, the geophysical human, the geological human, the you know the human that Dipesh Chakrabarti talks about. So, uh, so I mean, my answer to that, one of my answers is to talk about cairns, you know, those the piles of rocks. Um, which are, that's a kind of vernacular architecture uh, monuments. I'll share this uh, screen here. Um, uh, not these, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, this, uh, which are these phenomena where people just pile rocks. Um, and of course they've got many, you know, cultural specificities and histories and they're related to burial rituals and so on. But they are also a kind of stream spontaneous performance um, that seems to me in some ways um, a message from this future that I'm thinking about, this future of a different kind of monument. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I just throw that out there uh, for Branislav and, and um, Sam to jump in on. Uh, I will just say, first off, uh, I combined both of your talks and then I just imagined a tiny um, rat statue on top of Trafalgar's um, very tall thing, and then that made me really happy. <laughs> I've got a new monument idea, you guys. Um, it's really interesting to me because as you were just talking, uh, I was thinking about, you know, you asked the question, what does the non-human do to time? And I think that's a really pretty question and one that I've been thinking about, especially because, um, when I think about marine beach building or coral building, um, they are both uh, ways to talk about geological time and uh, and animals and other species with them, right? So the the reef is um, I feel like it's this ultimate monument to human power to recreate a geological structure, right? To say we are so powerful, like this is the ultimate mo monument to the Anthropocene, right? Um, is to recreate the ocean in the way that we imagine it should be passed to our children, that they need not look at a monument, they can live within it. And I think that that is a really powerful idea of how powerful humans think that they are. Um, and I was, I was really interested in that because combining the conversations about geology and, 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 um, and monuments in a very particular way, um, was asking myself kind of uh, about the difference between monuments that recreate or or seek to retain something versus those that memorialize something that we can't control. And so I was thinking of um, the the plaque that was just put on the glacier that is disappearing. Um, and what that kind of says that we're not like, oh, well, let's just rebuild a glacier, you guys. Like, let's not be able to do that. What is it about that that is allowing us to let go? 
Um, and instead, then for the things that I look at, we instead try to recreate those geological events or retain those animals. Um, and the reason I think of that is the difference between the monument to passenger pig pigeons, which often sits in direct contrast to Shavolsky's horses, who are almost always at those zoos. And we've worked really hard to genetically uh, recreate them in many instances. I mean, these are animals that we use as a monument in a really weird way. Um, and so what allows us to, to claim a final passenger pigeon, but to never claim that? for another species and kind of how does that change uh, the way we think about power and the way that these monuments talk about power because especially thinking about these um, proceedings and the way that we walk through these spaces and think about them um, you know how are they um, reifying the idea of state power or scientific power or those particular things that we're thinking about so that's how I was kind of putting um, all of these talks together, but I do really want to see Trafalgar Square remade in the, the most powerful way possible. Sounds great, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just um, <clears throat> sort of responding to your two responses, you know, um, in a way, I started thinking about, I mean, I mentioned the word archive, in a way, you know, an alternative to the monument is an archive and some, you know, obviously the Anthropocene is kind of archival, it's it's recording and it's recording, you know, extinct species, you know, endlings and as well as, um, you know, recording the changes and the, and the, the, the changes which will be geologized and, and present in the rocks for future generations. But I, I, I just thinking about what uh, Jacques Derrida said about the archive, you know, doing a typical Derridean sort of jujitsu where he turns it upside down and says the archive is supposed to be the most organized form of remembering that there could possibly be, but actually it, in, a, in a strange way, it's very a very good way of forgetting, you know, you sort of put things in a, in a building in the Natural History Museum or in a computer file or in a seed bank in Scandinavia, and then you lock the doors, you know, and um, I, I thought quite a, a lot about the relationship between memory and forgetting, and particularly in terms of the earth as well, you know, that um, I mean, Nietzsche thought uh, in one of his pieces, Friedrich Nietzsche talks about uh, having the need for a memory of the future, you know, which is like, you know, if, you, if you're going to be an, an actor, you, mu you, you mustn't be weighed down by the memory of the past, you know. So forgetting is, is an important skill. Forgetting isn't just a lack, it's actually something profoundly important. And that's, you know, animals, you know, rocks are brilliant at remembering, you know. Um, animals have to learn how to forget, to be other than a rock kind of thing, you know, um, to forget where they were, you know, move around. And stuff. Anyway, um, so just as archives, have this sort of ambiguity as to whether they are a, for, a, a brilliant form of memory or a brilliant form of forgetting. Uh, so too are monuments, you know, you could say as well. And I often thought that, you know, in the debates about the um, uh, toppling of statues. So in Bristol in the UK, you know, we had a statue of a Bristolian slave trader that was toppled into the harbour. And of course, the, the cry that goes up is they're trying to erase history, you know, as if history is all about preserving some kind of, you know, static form, rather than realizing, actually, that is history. And even the bloody Romans knew this, you know, that they were constantly getting rid of their, they even had a word for it, I can't remember what it was, but, you know, when you get rid of monuments, because history is changing. And so, um, and I did wonder, to connect to Sam's talk about reefs, you know, because I'm also interested in failure as success as well, you, you know, you, your question of failure, and sometimes things that fail, are better than things that work or seem to work seamlessly because of the way they provoke thought and they um, they reveal contradictions and things like that. So sometimes, you know, maybe, you know, a failed reef might be more successful than a totally successful reef in some way, you know, so maybe we need, that's another kind of way of thinking about the sort of open, openness of a, of, a, of a contemporary monument, I think. Wonderful. Um, I see three very related questions to what we've been talking about from 
uh, from the audience. Uh, Nancy and I thought we would just do them in order. Um, I think I have to click answer live. Is that right for everyone to see? Does everyone do all of the panelists see these or just? Yeah, okay, so this first one, um, uh, what Braun said about memory in monuments is like the mobility, the changes and meanings of the landscapes. Um, I'm not sure I totally answered the, I understand the question. Um, why don't perhaps anonymous attendee could try to reframe the question and we'll move on for the sake of yeah, time. Good idea. <laughs> so Hasha Lamki asks Yuna, uh, can you elaborate more on temporary monuments in particular 36.5? And I think it's a good time to really bring in this idea of temporary temporalities uh, as well. So. Right, yeah. Well, I'd be happy to. Um, and again, let me share my screen here. Uh, we're keeping you technically very busy, Nina. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> it's happening, it's working. Um, so 36.5 is um, a, uh, a piece by Cam uh, Sarah Cameron Sunder, and um, it's a performance in which she stands in um, the ocean or just, um, you know, off the sh uh, shore uh, for a full tidal cycle which is uh, around 13 hours. And she's performed this um, all over uh, the world, um, off the coasts of all the continents. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, what, one of the things that interests, and I should add that in a recent uh, issue of essays on this work, um, the art historian James Young discusses it as a monument. Uh, in, in you know great detail with uh, comparisons to uh, locus in the history of monuments and and um, counter monuments and ephemeral monuments. Um, so for, for me, what's uh, the two things that are powerful about this? One is um, its performativity, that it uh, is an activation of uh, the, all the humans involved there. Um, and then the, the second thing about it is um, that it's uh, um, it's open-ended in the sense of um, what it offers the community around it to do vis-a-vis -vis it and in response to it in the future. Um, because it's very collaborative with the communities in which it occurs, it, it sort of in, um, unleashes a series of potentialities of um, uh, community projects, of uh, uh, environmental initiatives, uh, of um, uh, artistic uh, opportunities, and so um, it's it's it poses itself as a beginning, rather than as many monuments do, as a kind of terminus. Um, and it's so, so let me just uh, stop there uh, and see if others want to jump in on this issue of, uh, of temporariness. And of course, the other thing about it is scale, is that it is very human scale, and yet it is set within um, a kind of planetary um, setting of, of the ocean. Um, and I can sh show some other images of it. Um, I think those are the only ones I have. I thought I had some with the uh, other settings. Um, but it, again, it, it um, um, allows one to start thinking about the more than human scales, which I think in the Anthropocene is the greatest challenge, is how to think beyond the human, uh, sort of constantly think beyond the human. So I'll stop there. Uh, does anyone want to add to that? To say, oh, go ahead, Ron. Well, maybe you see some. <laughs> Sorry, I just keep unmuting and muting myself. Um, it's interesting to think about 
temporary things and especially that art piece when you're talking about the ocean um and i think part of it is just that for someone who uh, works on the marine environment uh it feels that humans have always thought that the ocean was both timeless and everything in it is constantly shifting. Um, and in truth, when you think about island building, um, there there really is no way to not make them temporary, right? There's no way to keep them from eroding. Um, and so it's interesting to me to think of, of or imagine uh, that monuments in the marine environment would be anything but temporary. And so these monuments, uh, like that particular piece, which is really beautiful, um, are, are maybe the only monuments that, that one can do in that environment, like temporary <laughs> places. Um, um, Sam, I do, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. um, there have been a number of, uh, you know, sculptural monuments now being located in the most, you showed some of them, or one of you showed some of them. Um, but I guess the, uh, the one by Jason DeCares Taylor is very well known. There are lots of articles about this, who does these underwater museums. Mm -hmm. um, and there are really huge amounts of those. Um, I guess one question you could ask is if they're multi-species monuments. And that's the question that I would ask. Um, and one of the reasons I didn't show them more extensively is because they are not monuments that take into account oftentimes the environment in which they've been placed or to fit into that environment. Um, and so they're a bit jarring <laughs> when you see them. Um, I mean, they're beautiful, but it's hard to see what they are a monument of in some sense. Well, I think that uh, uh, tailors are in fact intended to be habitats. Mm -hmm. I don't know how successful they are. You would be able to judge that much more. Um, but they are also intended to be a kind of collaboration with the sea life and with the things that begin to grow on them. So they change their, their forms. So, it, you know, Sarah's is called a uh, performance with the sea. So mm -hmm. in that sense, these are monuments that are inviting marine life to participate with them in memorializing health, the health, future health of the ocean, so, something like that. Uh, as as far as the the creepiness of it, which I think you know, those are very very creepy looking. Um, I started out, you know, finding that prob really hard to deal with, but in some ways I've now developed a kind of affection for that creepiness because I think it's a, opens a space of critique, mm -hmm. and I think that monuments are so. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a kind of a seriousness and a discourse of dignity and around that. Whereas I think to displace that, one has to um, find modes of irony, critique, um, grotesquerie, horror, other, other styles. Yeah. If I can just jump in. Um, on that, the seriousness of the monument, I mean, Mario Carpo talks about the the you know the um monument you know which comes from the you know the latin monere meaning to remind to, to bring to mind as it were the past or something some important values but it's also the same word in admonish meaning to kind of to berate or to tell off you know so when we stand in front of one of these classic monuments we feel admonished you know we are lesser you know it performs our finitude and our, our unworthiness as it were when we are faced by some great person on a horse or whatever but um I just wanted to return to this temporary monument thing because it is a it is a paradox, isn't it? Because monuments also are supposed to be permanent, you know. So how can you have a temporary monument? And it strikes me that yeah, you talk about um, bringing to mind, you know, in your conversation, you two, Sam and Nina, you know. And I think that's important. And if you remember my slide where I said like in pre literate cultures, you know, ritual f performs the same function of meshing these different times together so that when you speak certain words or you do certain actions, you know, as it were human time and the time of the gods or or whatever are, are coming together. And I think in a way, you know, like your, what your, the, your example that you used of standing in the ocean with the tide going up and down has this sort of ritual feel to it. And I think you can see how we sort of merge together a little bit. I just, uh, I mean, when we talk about the Anthropocene and these types of conversations, um, 
one of the things that always strikes me about these particular monuments where you put, you know, statues, I mean, there is one in which there are hundreds of statues of people in everyday clothing sitting underneath the ocean, just going about their day. We've created a human cityscape <laughs> almost in the ocean. And there's actually nothing I can think of that's more Anthropocene than that, because in some sense, it's trying to um, realize this Jacques Cousteau idea of Homo aquaticus, like our return to the ocean, to a place that we do not belong. And what's really interesting, I actually don't find them particularly creepy, but I find it interesting because um, Dolly Jorgensen's work about normalizing uh, that which does not belong in the ocean. So the more we put human things on the bottom of the ocean, the more we convince ourselves that that memorial is to us, ocean dwellers, even though in this multi-species monument, we do not belong there and we cannot thrive in that environment. And so in some sense, it feels like the ultimate future monument, as Braun said earlier, like this forgetting that we don't belong there and uh and like pitching ourselves into it as an idea that eventually we will be welcome in this space um and so it's a really important thing for me to think about in the sense that we just it is a, a it's not a good environment <laughs> for us um and so the only thing humans find at the bottom of the ocean most of the time is death right the monuments that are most meaningful in these places are shipwrecks and i do find them to be both temporary because they break up they disintegrate um, and they have this type of interesting meaning. And we can talk about the Titanic in this instance because we have so much fighting going on over memorializing that space, who gets to see it, who gets to go down there, et cetera. Um, but, you know, um, you know, I think that's, yes. And someone had asked, right, about other monuments or animal-based, non-human-based monuments. And that would be a very interesting one to talk about as a whale fall, yeah. Yeah, I was itching to get to Natasha's question because it's such a good one to flip the script on, would any other species even be interested in a monument? Let's start with like that question is, this is why I think Nancy and I use the word preposterous because in our thinking, we were thinking about monuments not in, in memory of other species as much as what is a dynamic, perhaps even evolving. And, and somebody later, I'm gonna fold a couple of questions in here for the sake of time because these answers have been so rich. Uh, Nathan's uh, thinking about procedure, the idea of procedure as a, a possible monument system. So there, there's, um, there's some like this very rich, very rich stuff in there, in those, in the kind of those two, those two analog parts of, of a question, I think. Have at it, people. <laughs> um, I'll just quickly say I don't. Um, I don't really have anything to say in this moment about um, the, the uh, monuments that other species build. But what somehow what this made me think about was something we Marina and I just heard about yesterday from our colleague Jennifer Jacket, who has uh, uh, done a project with an artist. Um, a, called intergen, an intergenerational apology, and it's about um, a kind of monument that speaks to the future, which is so, sort of uh, and tries to flip the script on the the um, his, you know sort of historiographical nature of monuments um, by asking uh, what is it that we should be saying now from this anthropocenic moment uh, to the all the life forms of the future. I, I know that that's not uh, really answering those two questions, but it occurred to me as another way to uh, open up this logic of of uh, the, the backward facing nature of monuments uh, and the monument as closure versus what I'm after, which is the monument as an opening. Um, you know, into possibilities, into uh, new alignments, altogether new alignments with time, with other species, um, and with the unknown. Um, I appreciate the, the questions you have about the climate clock in New York, which I don't know much about. Um, 
doesn't yeah and the also the procedures <laughs> as a monument and i really need to think about that what one i mean that's getting into that that computational route seems to me um you know that, that just needs a lot more more thoughts there i suppose i mean the climate clock is obviously a, it, it, it's almost literally you know, over literally isn't it talking about how earth time and human time are coming together and we've got this sort of deadline to do something you know to uh um to to, to prevent you know um dangerous climate change um it doesn't strike me as multi-species in a way i'm i'm still yeah i'm still interested in you know we could talk a lot longer i think about the multi-species monument in you know and obviously we've, we've come out you know it's come out this sort of distinction between a habit you know a, a monument as habitat a multi-species habitat but then but in terms of its kind of semi semiotics um you know so in a way what you'd expect a monument for all species you know the, the first thing you might expect would be it's actually you know it's not the species that are living on the island it's the species that are no longer you know no longer can live there you know or, or something like that it's absent you know it's often absent particulars isn't it um um so yeah I, i'm not sure exactly you know i couldn't come up with a sort of a general um, account of what a what a multi-species um monument would how that would work in terms of uh, those times i was talking about well i mean i think i would say that besides the semiotics of monuments there's also a question i think for me about the the ethics or the effic um, efficacy of monuments. Um, and again, this goes to what Bronislaw was saying earlier about ritual. Um, and of course, the different kinds of rituals. And I tend to think that many rituals are conservative. Um, and again, harken back to some kind of uh, past or try to stabilize things versus the rituals that might be needed now, which could be more uh, produ generative, productive. I don't know if they'd still be rituals or whether they would be just performances. There's yeah, something very new. Um, but, uh, you know, I, as some of the very well-known uh, multi-species monuments, I guess the best known is Maya Lin's What is Missing? And there's a great effort in that project to um, be future oriented uh, and to engage people in, you know, in many registers. There's the listening cone, um, and then there's the uh, website, and there's uh, um, information about the um, causes and the habitats and so forth. So it's a very um, capacious, uh, Kind of memorialization. It's very different from the uh, Endlings monuments, you know, which are just filled with sorrow and grief and guilt. Um, so I think that that's another, you know, are, are there productive rituals? Are there rituals for um, inviting new habitats to, to occur? I think. Um... Bringing up the climate clock is really interesting to me because it feels like a future monument to humans as endlings, since we've been talking about endlings, right? I think when people talk about monuments and as we're talking about multi-species monuments, we're still imagining that the other species, the ones that we're memorializing are animals and that we humans are kind of left out of that monument. And I think the climate clock suggests something other. And when people see it, I think they think, oh, you know, that's when the earth is going to go bad and all these other animals are going to go extinct. Um, but what seems to be happening, and maybe this is trying to change people's minds, is that that is the monument to us, right? We are the ones that can't survive that clock ticking down. And so in some sense, there's some kind of weird temporality and also cognitive dissonance in that beautiful monument, right? That, that we're staring at our own 
a monument to us, <laughs> the end of us. Um, and that is a really pretty, I'm, I'm, maybe I can't think of a more important single species monument, right? I don't care about multi-species. The human monument uh, to us as ending uh, seems more powerful. And, and maybe the irony there is that most people are not finding that powerful in that climate clock, right? They don't see that when they look at that particular monument. Um, and gosh, I can't say the jokes on them, but like, <laughs> that's like a really big problematic thing. And so I love that you brought that up because, you know, as we talk about humans spreading and controlling and thinking, like that's a really great monument to think about um, the kind of ridiculousness of, of what we're talking about when it comes to monuments to others, right? Um, we have to wrap it up in a second. Nancy, I think, has some closing remarks, but I want to just insert one so we don't leave on our endling monument. Um, for me, the most powerful uh, line to think to, to think through as an artist going forward is demands to be enacted, and for whom, you know, because there's a lot of ways in which a monument can support a multitude of new rituals that are really truly from other species, not just humans. And that I would like to leave on a more positive note, so. <laughs> yeah, I wanna just, I wanna thank uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. I wanna thank all of our presenters. I was so quiet this whole time because I was just in complete rapture listening to you talk. Um, I, we definitely have leaving with so many things to think about. And I think my, my closing idea that kind of comes from all of your presentations is the idea of, you know, what, along with the ritual, what values, you know, might we start thinking about bringing into this new way of thinking, um, you know, and I, I hope that we find ways to continue this conversation. I'm um, completely energized and delighted by uh, our time together today. So thanks again to NYU Abu Dhabi and thanks again to all of our panelists. Um, this has been wonderful.